Hello everybody, this is Bernard Kempinski with the Aquile Line, my O-Scale Railroad set in the Civil War. And in this video I'd like to show you some tips and techniques I use to paint the backdrops on my railroad. A backdrop adds an immense amount of realism to your model railroad. And that realism is enhanced if you can paint clouds on the backdrop. In this scene, we see very narrow benchwork on my railroad, but thanks to the terrain and the sky painted on the backdrop, the scene seems to extend off into infinity. When painting your backdrop, there are many different types of clouds, and even the color of the sky is different. It depends on the time of year you're modeling, the time of day you're modeling, and the location you're modeling. You can just go with a plain sky, and here we see a very hazy day at the Port of Los Angeles, and that can be effective and simple to do. However, I would stay away from scenes like this. Sunsets, strong harsh lighting, storms, they're hard to pull off and they don't represent a typical condition. You're better off with scenes like this, which help draw the eye in. This is in Idaho and it's the big sky country. Now this scene is in Virginia in the wintertime and it's typical of the type of sky I might see in the time period that I'm modeling. Notice that the sky has both atmospheric perspective, which is the haze that you get at the horizon. So you go from dark blue at the top to almost white at the bottom and geometric perspective. Now this is the perspective that is formed by the clouds. Remember that clouds are three-dimensional objects. They are not amorphous blobs that float in the sky. And they often form at the same altitude. So you get sort of a table or roof effect over your head. And these lines I drew on these clouds are trying to convey the foreshortening that the clouds do. That is, they get smaller as they go to the horizon and they get closer together. And as they come closer to you, they become bigger so that even a cloud that would over your head would be huge, would fill your whole ceiling. Any two-dimensional representation of an actual scene will have a vanishing point as part of the perspective. This is fine for a single image where the viewer is only going to have one point of view when looking at the image. However, in a backdrop, people can look at the sky from various points of view, and so a vanishing point that works from one location won't be right for another location. And the way you get around this is by using a modified point of view I and mean, getting rid of those angular lines that point to a vanishing point and just try to paint a planar array of clouds that foreshorten as they get to the horizon. Now, there may be some times where you want to have a vanishing point painted on your backdrop. For example, here at Aquile Landing, we have a large piece of bench work that extends from the layout and we have a cove corner in the background. And to the left there's a door, and to the right there are other doors for closets and things. So we want people to be drawn into this scene. So we put a vanishing point in the cove corner and have the clouds pointing to that corner. And it does help draw the eye in, and then you ignore the parts of the room that are not scenic and part of the layout. Okay, now that we've talked a little bit about the theory, Let's see how we actually paint backdrops. And we'll start with room prep. Now in this room, in my basement, I had finished sheetrock walls, which were painted a light gray, which was actually a pretty good primer. So I didn't have to do any priming. However, I did want to cove the corners and coving the corners is putting up a piece of material to hide the sharp corner by making a nice smooth transition. Uh, in this case, I used masonite and I screwed it to the walls only at the extremities. And I call this a floating cove because there is no structure behind the arc. So the masonite is self-supporting except for the fact that it's been screwed to the walls. And it will expand as the humidity in this basement changes uh, differentially with respect to the walls. And if it was constrained in too many places, it will start to crack at the extremities. And so by leaving it free floating the way I do, uh, I have had no problems with expansion and contraction. Uh, I do 
try to get it screwed into the studs at the extremities of the boards and then I sand down that edge so it's a little bit more of a taper not a perfect point but a taper and then you can make up the rest of that with sheetrock and mud it usually takes about two coats of sheetrock mud to get that the way you want it once the walls are primed it's time to add the color and I like to use a light blue sky color not too dark because this is indoors the room lights are never going to be as bright as sunlight and so I go with a slightly lighter color which will look darker anyway and I'm going to blend them to the horizon with some white colors so it's going to get a little lighter at the bottom and the reason I do this is uh, blue, light blue, is a cheerful color. So you want your layout room to be a happy place to come down and spend time. You don't want it to be a gloomy setting with an overcast or a stormy day. Also, it's not unrealistic for me because in March in Virginia, we do get low humidity and we do get crisp sunny days like we're having today. So having a bright blue sky is actually prototypically correct for my layout. Now, I use regular conventional house paints for this. This is a, a blue. I mentioned it's a light blue. Uh, they calling it blue chalk, I think. The color names don't really mean much. You got to go by the shades and the sample cards. And for my white, I'm using Kills stain blocking paint. Ironically, the stain blocking paint, which should be opaque, when you thin it with water, makes a really good transparent glaze over the uh, existing paint. So this gets to the point of wet on wet versus solid color the way I do it. So I like to just apply a uniform coat of blue and I like to use a roller. This gets rid of any brush strokes which are unrealistic on a backdrop. They're fine for a impressionist art painting but they don't look good on backdrops. Uh, and I use a bigger brush like this to cut in the ceiling and around the edges and if you can't cut in very well uh, then use masking tape. Keep the paint off of where you don't want it. And then once I have that solid color is all dry, I will go in and add my transparent glazes to get my haze. Now other people recommend the wet on wet technique where you apply the two colors at the same time and try to blend them while they're wet. That works great with oil paints. Does not work that well with acrylic paints. The acrylic paints dry too fast. So you end up using a spray bottle and a wet brush to try to get the colors to delay. Um, you end up putting too much water and it runs and you end up wiping it and having to do it two or three times to get a decent blend. And even then it's hard to get a good blend. It's also physically tiring to do that. It's okay if you're doing it over a small painting, uh, but if you have to do 70, 100, 150 feet of backdrop and you're going like this for hours on end, that, that gets old. So I find it's much simpler to put the solid color on and then just build up the glazes as needed. And the nice thing about this is because it dries so fast, you get instant feedback about how much more glaze you're gonna need. Now, for the clouds, I use small brushes because uh, you know there's, some of them are quite small. You can use the bigger brush to do the big ones. And the key item here, I think, I think what really sells this as a three-dimensional object is to paint in the shadows. And I use Payne's Gray, which when you first squeeze it out of the tube, it looks black. But it's really a darker blue-gray color. And if you mix it with your sky blue and the white, you get all the various shade colors that are in the cloud. And uh, you apply them and then you can put glazes over them to blend them. And it works really well. And you notice I use a piece of cardboard as a palette. It's nothing fancy. And the last thing I want to mention is uh, keep some prototype photos available when you're painting. Uh, these help you remind you of what the scene is supposed to look like. And if you just paint from memory, there are things you're going to forget. And it's good to have this. And if you're painting a prototype scene, like one time I did a, a mountain in Vermont for a friend, we actually had the picture of the mountain in front of us and we tried to copy it onto the backdrop. So uh, with that, we'll now show you some actual examples of me painting the backdrop on my railroad. I'm gonna now demonstrate painting the clouds along the horizon. So I'll be painting these clouds here that are way along the horizon. However, 
Here's my terrain line because the ground on the railroad here, this is now the east wall of the railroad. The ground, the terrain is sloping up. It'll actually be above my head when it gets down there. So this here is the same altitude as some of those other bigger clouds. So I'm, I'm really, it's like as if I was painting only that much. So a lot of those little ones I'm gonna leave out, but the same basic technique would apply. And what I'm gonna do is actually paint some of them below here so you can see, but then remember that this line is where uh, we'll, they'll get painted over. So the first thing we do is get some Payne's gray on the brush, mix it with some blue and white, We'll just get a faint paint gray. And now my horizon is right about here, looking at the rest of the layout. So that would be the horizon for the rest of the layout. So what I'm gonna do is just paint little lines like this. I wouldn't call it a checkerboard, but these are, this is establishing the geometric perspective. All right. And I'm just laying in a few of these. Now remember, I, I will end up painting over these. So this is just for demonstration purposes. But I'm just showing you how I go about building that up. And I'm, I'm checking my other lines and make sure I got it right. Okay, and now they get, the lines start getting a little further apart as they go higher up and they get longer. So this gap's a little bigger. And here comes along the line. That's dark, but we'll light it later. And here comes another longer one. And here's another one. Now these are going to be visible when the railroad is uh, finished. So I have to plan this out. So here comes a small one. Here's some big ones. And now uh, at this distance, I want to go even a little higher. There's a formula you can follow, but because this is clouds, they could be in any position relative to each other. And so you don't have to follow the formula, I just sort of eyeball. Okay, so there's, uh, that's a, sort of the grid I'm gonna follow. And um, what I would do is I would take this little brush and then just go in and dab the little clouds on those lines. So these are the very, very far clouds. You can put some haze in between them. and use your finger to blur them. And I need to clean the gray off of this because there's still a little gray left on there. Get a little bit of white here. And scrub some in because they're not always perfectly formed. And the closer you get to the horizon, the more they, the more they blend together and kind of disappear. So that's our kind of our first line of clouds way off right at the right at the horizon Okay, so I'm back painting this area. And uh, these clouds need to be a little bigger when you look at this elevation in relation to the rest of the layout. So I'm gonna make these clouds a bit bigger so they match the others. And one point I did not make earlier was when you're painting clouds on a backdrop, you want to avoid big spiky things because they look okay when you look at them straight on, but when you look at them up likely, like you normally do on a railroad when you're watching trains coming and going, all those spikes foreshorten and they look like points and they, and they just don't look right. So try to paint things long and linear. Even mountains are that same, same way. Don't make big spiky things, like don't go up like that.
So let's see, what do we got? Now, one thing that's going on down here is because of the window up there. And if you look way on this side of the room, you can see how I cove the skyboard. So that's really how you're supposed to do it. And I, I put a little white haze fade in there. But when you when I got down here because of that issue with the fire escape and such, I did not want to cove this. And so what's going to happen? This is the Professor Thaddeus Lowe's balloon camp. He was stationed at Falmouth. And so there's going to be an observation balloon. The terrain will be coming up. So this balloon will actually be sitting up about this high. And that's a 157th scale or 156th scale balloon. So it's a little smaller than the actual O scale balloon. So it's the right size. Uh, it's a 50 year old kit and I'm going to try it. If I don't like it, I did buy a foam ball that I'm going to use to try to make a balloon. The problem is the real balloon had way more lines on it than this one does. But anyways, here to give me perspective and size. And so if this is up there, it will help hide that corner. And then my main problem will be how to deal with the shadows that the balloon casts on the wall. So I'm gonna have to figure something out there. But what this will do is it prevented me from having to cove this corner because I did not want to just do a cove there. I didn't think it would look right. So just left this corner alone without a cove and we'll use the balloon to hide the uh, the corner. Now because of that balloon is going to be in the corner, I want to put some clouds up here. The idea being that we'll kind of draw your eye to this and not more so much to the corner, although the balloon may defeat that and people may want to look at the balloon. Actually, every time I look at the balloon, I giggle. How many people have a balloon on their on their railroad? But in my case, it's not gratuitous. There was a balloon, it, it did function up through the Battle of Chancellorsville, and then once uh, they headed to Gettysburg, that balloon, uh, they had a falling out with the professor who knew about the balloon, the army captain took over, cut his pay because he didn't want the balloon guy being paid more than him, very petty, and so that guy quit, and when he quit, the balloon corps didn't have the expertise, and so it's, it gradually faded, or quickly faded, I should say. But uh, we'll have a balloon here. That kit, like I said, it's a 50-year-old kit. It's not a great kit. Uh, so I may have to scratch build a balloon. But at least I know, you know roughly what it's supposed to look like. Let's put some shadows in here with a smaller brush. Mix a little blue with our shadow paint. dry darker so we'll wait and see what happens. Okay now that the basic clouds on the layout are dry what I want to do is take a little bit of water, wet my brush, dip it in some of my white brush it out and put it on a rag. So I just want a very thin wash and I'm just going to apply it on the backdrop like this. And um, those lines that you see are my planned terrain lines and they're, they're kind of like a crayon so they might smear a little bit. But see, I'm uh, just getting a little blend. That's a little too, too uh, opaque right now so you can thin it and just keep brushing it out. And what this does is it creates the atmospheric perspective that we're looking for and helps blend the things together. So you can do like this and then brush that way. And I'm getting that haze. Remember I talked about the how hard it was to do wet on wet. This is so much simpler. And I'm just putting in some haze at the horizon. And you, know, you can step back periodically and look at it. So if you're applying, applying the wash and say, oops, I put too much on like that. You take a, a wet paper towel and you just rub it. 
and and you get the effect you're looking for. And this technique will be familiar to anyone that paints models with acrylics or figures with acrylics because they, you learn that unlike oil paints, which you actually blend the paints on the model, when you paint with acrylics, you just build up the depth with these semi-transparent layers. And it, it, it really works. Some of these acrylic painted figures are just unbelievable. And you can see we're getting a nice effect on the backdrop here too. So I don't think it needs any more. So what, it took me five minutes to do four feet, six feet, that ain't bad. And uh, there you go, that's all you need for the haze. Um, one thing I do when I paint my backdrops is I'll let them percolate for a while. I'll look at them and I'll think about them. And so like last night when I was looking at these clouds over here, and I'll pan over, I thought these clouds were a little too regular. And so I'm gonna go back in and I put some pencil lines up here and I'm going to actually make these clouds a little longer. And the reason for that is this part of the layout is, it goes to the code tunnel area over there. And then that's the wall, that's the stairs going up over there. So a lot of times people are gonna be standing about where this camera is, but they're gonna be lower. I want these clouds to be long and stretched out. I don't want them to be foreshortened too much. So that's why I'm gonna make them longer. And uh, I'm gonna do that and I'll show it to you in a second. As I mentioned, I'm gonna make these clouds a little bit bigger and a little more long compared to their height. So I'm just gonna put in, it won't even be that dark. And like I said, I'll look at it and I'll think about it. And maybe a month from now, I'll come in and I'll change it a little bit just to you know, let it percolate, let it see what you think. And a nice thing about acrylics is if you really hate what you did, prime it, do it all over again. Uh, it's possible. I've done that, let me think. I did that uh, in the other room when I had to remodel a uh, Falmouth. I ended up repainting the whole area, so. Now I want to paint some uh, wispy cloud in this area. So I'm going to go with this prototype scene. So I've got my horizon clouds in. And uh, what this will do is it'll establish a little bigger cloud here. This, this part of the layout, you can't see it, but there's two windows right here. I need these windows because that one's a fire escape. And that was my fresh air. And so I really couldn't cold this corner. So I want to put something between these two windows to take your distractive viewer from looking at those windows. So what we're gonna do is put in a, a cloud and you can just barely see it. I've sketched in with very light blue artist pencil what I want up there. And I'm gonna start just putting in the, the rough shape of the cloud. Uh, this one's a little more wispy than some of the other clouds I've done. Clouds are three-dimensional objects, so they're, they're water vapor, they have shadows underneath where the sunlight's blocked and they get brighter on the top. So what I'm doing here is I'm putting in the top. Now this particular prototype cloud I'm copying is a little wispier than some of the others I've done. See these others are a little more defined along the top and this one has some wispy stuff and maybe is behind it. So I'll put some wispy clouds up here like this and then maybe another little wispy one here. And notice I'm just using a little bit of white and just, just, I believe artists call this scumbling where you just try to blend these two colors together. Uh, anyway, just a couple little random shapes there. Okay, so that's sort of this area here. Now I'm gonna go back and work my, my main cloud. And it looks like I wanna put some gray in here. So let's get some Payne's gray. And uh, I don't know if you can see that. I'll put some of my blue too, the blue. I'll put some blue with my panes and uh, that gives me a little less intense shadow color. 
There we go. Put a little bit of white. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put in those two shadows. So we'll just start putting in some gray here. I've got little pencil lines on my wall. Give me a guideline. But they're not 100%. You don't have to always, you know, you can go outside the lines here. So nobody's, nobody's judging us that regard. This is interesting because there's a darker cloud here. Now I have a light up there and I have a light up here. So this part of the room is in a bit of a shadow. I may have to put another ceiling light up here. But, um, you know, it, it's hard to control the shadows in a layout, especially if you have multiple lights coming down on the layout. All right, so now I'm blending in, reducing the intensity of that gray just by, just by putting a little bit of white on top of it. Now over here, remember I said we wanted to make believe that this gray one is in front of that one. So I'm gonna take some more gray with some white and I'm just gonna go over it so that it looks like it's on top. Oops, I'm getting too much darkness there. Darkness is not too much, too intense. Okay, there we go, that looks a little better. And uh, maybe I'll switch. The one thing I do not have is a little bucket of water, which I should have gotten because you need to rinse your brushes out if they're not a good. So I will go get that. Okay, well, let's take a look at the finished sky and backdrop for now. I will come back later when I have the terrain forms a little better form to paint in the ground. But for now, we will go with the sky and the backdrop. I want to thank you for watching. I hope you found this video interesting and you're willing to give it a shot on your backdrop.